today. We have the honor of having Dr. Laura Waller. Dr. Laura Waller is a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. And she is going to explain to us what do we get when we get gigapixels in microscopy. So let's welcome our speaker. Thanks. Uh, so the research that my group does is very interdisciplinary, and I give this same talk to a really wide range of audiences. For example, in optics, uh, signal processing, computer science, data scientists. So for that reason, sometimes uh, I will say things that you might not recognize the jargon, so just stop me and ask me if that's a problem, uh, and or if you have questions that you're not understanding. Probably someone else is feeling the same way. So what we do is uh, computational microscopy. And it's sort of optics plus signal processing, uh, trying to do together what neither can do alone. And the whole impetus for this whole like, field of research is just rethinking your camera. So if you think about it, cameras really haven't changed a lot since they were invented. And they were invented to mimic your eye. You have a lens that's going to take the world and focus it onto some 2D plane, or maybe a, a curved plane. And then you have a sensor that just records the image. And it's done, right? So the optics is doing everything. And the sensor's job is only to record what happens at the end. And the, it's always the optics that has to make this perfect image on the sensor so you can get whatever picture that you like. So the idea of computational imaging is to forget about this sort of uh, narrow-minded way of designing cameras and optical systems and start to think about now I have computers so now after I take that picture at the sensor I can do all kinds of things with that data I can process it in all kinds of ways and this opens up wildly new design possibilities where I can take pictures that just look like garbage but they contain information about an image that I'm trying to reconstruct and when you when you break this sort of uh, way of thinking, then you get to the point where you can capture things that represent maybe more dimensions, so three-dimensional information, for example, or different information that you otherwise would never have captured in a traditional two-dimensional image. Okay, so if you look back, this is a pretty biased opinion, but if you look back in optical imaging, it's been around hundreds of years. This was the first, real, the first microscope uh, that was ever developed. And it's not that different than our current microscope. In the same way, it has a lens, it has a sample, and then you look at it. So they didn't have sensors back then, they just used their eyes. And then something to move the object around. But now we have really fancy optics, but all of it is doing essentially the same thing, the same sort of main pieces. So this was hundreds of years ago that we were able to start making optical elements, making lenses. Um, a big change was when we started to be able to record those sensor images. So instead of having scientists looking through their microscope and drawing with a pencil what they see as their result, then we could actually capture things. This was photochemical, right? So film cameras, maybe you're too young to know about these, uh, but they existed when I was a kid. Um, and now we have computational imaging, big part driven by digital capture. Now we switch to digital sensors, right? Almost everybody has a digital camera, not a film camera. And this is despite the fact that film cameras actually have much better resolution. That you, you, don't ha you have more megapixels on a film camera, but you can't digitally manipulate it afterwards. And so the ability to store, duplicate, and digitally process our data afterwards is huge, and we're willing to give up performance for it. So sort of the, the new piece is to say, now that we can digitally capture things, we have a chance to do a lot of processing on the digital side after we capture uh, something at the sensor, which is not necessarily a traditional image. So here's an example. And I'm trying to say the computer is becoming a part of our imaging system. It's, we're systems engineers. We're designing optical systems. And the computer becomes one of the pieces of the system that has capabilities to do all kinds of things that optics simply can't do. So here's a great example. This is one of the sort of like the poster child of computational imaging. And uh, so these people will take a, a normal camera, say an SLR camera, and they, they need to modify the optical design. We can't just 
take a normal picture and expect to get three-dimensional information out of it, right? That's just not going to happen. So you need to modify the optical design. In this situation, for this example, I'm putting in just a lenslet array. So it's a grid, a 2D grid of, a small, uh, of small little lenses, so an array of lenses. And I shove it into my optical system. I take a picture. Well, that bunch of lenses really mess with my optical system. And so the picture that I take now really just looks like garbage. But uh, it was designed specifically to capture three-dimensional information. So now you send it to the computer uh, and get a bunch of nerds to crunch the data. And what do you get? OK, you get a normal image at the output. That's great. But actually, it's better than a normal image because now I can digitally refocus this image because I have the three-dimensional information. So I not only know what the picture should look like, but I know what depth every piece of the picture is. So I can artificially make it look like I'm focusing on the front or the back, or I can make basically a 3D map. And there's a bunch of companies in this space right now. You're going to see this on your cell phones. I really believe within the next five years, you're going to have this capability. Pelican just got 25 million from Qualcomm to add this to your cell phone camera. And I think you'll see it coming really soon. So there's some really great examples in computational imaging of ways people have figured out to modify their optical system so that with processing they can do all kinds of things. This is, uh, doesn't really have a good purpose, but it's a great uh, example. So this is a, a single pixel camera. This came out of Rice University. And what they did was they took a, they basically imaged a regular image onto this special device called a DMD. It's a deformable mirror device. It's what's inside projectors. And basically what the DMD does is it can either block the light at a particular pixel or pass it through. And it can dynamically change in time, whether it's going to pass a pixel's light or <coughs> block it. So if you turn everything black, then you just get a black image. So then what they do is they, they just use a lens to collect all the light from this modulated image onto a uh, single pixel, which is just a photodiode, just one single photo detector. And then by taking a bunch of single pixel images with different codes on this coded mask, then they can figure out what the image was from a single pixel. So it's multiple measurements, but it's a single pixel for each one. So the original image here in both these cases has a couple hundred pixels by a couple hundred pixels in either dimension. But with only 2% of that number of pixels captured, they can reconstruct a pretty good representation of this object. And this is a concept called compressed sensing, where the idea is that rather than capturing a whole lot of data and then having to deal with this gigantic data set and try to compress it, so you do JPEG compression on your images, um, or you do whatever you can to compress it so that you can store it with less bits, right? So compressed sensing is all about, let's do that compression in the capture stage. So instead of capturing everything and then throwing away a whole bunch of the stuff I captured that wasn't important, let's just only capture the important stuff. And if you want to do that, you have to do it sort of in the pipeline of the imaging system. So this is a really hot topic right now in computational imaging of how to design these systems to efficiently find the important information without knowing what the object was to start with. <coughs> uh, so going a little further into this, if we start putting weird masks into our cameras, then I showed you if I put this little array of lenses, then I can, I can recover 3D information. Well, it turns out if I put in weird amplitude masks that just block the light, this is just a piece of cardboard with some holes cut in it, then I can get all, uh, some really like good 3D information. I can get nice depth maps. This is related to how the Connect, Microsoft Connect works. Not exactly the same. This is all passive, so there's no illumination control here. And then the last one I have, since I do microscopy, is something that just won the Nobel Prize last year. And this was the ideas of super resolution. And they take a conventional microscope, and this is simply the best resolution you can get out of a conventional microscope because of the fundamental diffraction limit. You can't beat physics. And you can't, get, you can't resolve things that are smaller than this. However, if you take a bunch of pictures where only a couple things are turned on at once, you can localize them very accurately. And then across 1,000 or 10,000 images, you can actually put, you can map out this really high resolution picture. And so this has been really important for biology because we can now see things with optical microscopes 
that we shouldn't be able to see. Okay, so we do optics, and there's a lot of regimes of optics. A lot of photography deals with ray optics and geometrical optics, but we're talking about wave optics. So my point is that light is a wave. It has an amplitude and a phase. And so all our wave optics stuff, pretty much we have to think about phase. So I have a sinusoid, right? It has both an amplitude and a phase. How shifted is this sinusoid? Um, so we need to think about how phase affects uh, our, our images. So here's a great example. Digital holography, it's called. This is really easy to set up. You take a laser, you just make it into a bigger laser beam, and you put a sensor. This is the whole imaging system. It's lensless imaging in the sense that there's no lenses between my object and the sensor. So all I'm doing here is I'm just going to shove an object, it's a transmissive object, in between uh, the laser and the sensor. And what do I get? Well, uh, if you've taken any physics classes, you know you get diffraction patterns. So these ringing patterns you see, this is diffraction. This is exactly the same phenomenon as the two slit experiments that you see in physics. So this is useless, right? I'm not seeing anything of, of value from my object. This object was actually uh, a little water tank with some disgusting bugs in it that we scooped out of the pond. Uh, and what's happening is there's stuff in here, but it's being all diffracted, and it's not imaged, right? So it's totally out of focus. And we take this picture, but if I just zoom in on one chunk of the picture, something is clearly happening here. There's, there's actually a little bug there, and he's diffracting some of the light. So I'm taking this out of focus picture with all these diffraction rings in it, and uh, the key thing is that I know how light propagates. So given that there was something here, and it simply propagated to the sensor, nothing else happened in between, then I can computationally undo the propagation. So I can take my picture that I captured and computationally uh, change the focus position. And this only works with laser light. So this is only true for coherent laser light. You can't do this with a regular camera. Um, but if I do that, then I'm, I can simply do this computation on the original image. And I'm propagating to different distances. Eventually, I find the correct distance, and this little bug comes into focus. So this was simply an image processing uh, algorithm applied to the original image here to get this uh, little bug in focus. And I know what distance I had to propagate it to find the focus, so I also know its 3D position. So uh, here's another one, that another little bug that we found in there. This is a diatom. And uh, it's essentially like we're getting 3D information because we find the depths of these objects as well. Um, and all we had to do was illuminate with laser illumination and forget about lenses. Uh, what does the processing do? Well, actually, it's really simple. So if you look at the physics behind this, What's happening is you have some, some field at the object, and the defocused or propagated field is simply the original one convolved with this weirdo impulse function, which we know from physics. And so we can simply deconvolve out this, uh, this impulse function. So this is a matter of doing a Fourier transform and an inverse Fourier transform. So we can do this really fast uh, in parallel. Okay, so then uh, the bigger example for most of what my lab does is phase imaging. And the idea there is, is that light is a wave and we don't measure phase. So we measure intensity. Um, intensity is amplitude squared and it has nothing to do with phase. So we always lose phase information when we take a normal picture. And normally we don't care about phase. So it's really only in wave optics when things are really small that uh, that phase effects start to really matter, that diffraction starts to play a big role. If I'm looking at the normal world with a regular camera, these effects are happening, but they're so small, they just don't matter relative to what I care about. So in microscopy, we do care. And one really key piece is that uh, if I look at an intensity image, which is like a normal image from a microscope, then most biological samples are completely invisible. Uh, these are cancer cells, HeLa. And uh, they're unstained and untreated, and na natively, they just don't absorb any light. So you won't see them in the intensity picture, because intensity is a map of how much the light has been absorbed through the sample. And it's not being absorbed. But if I can, and I will, get a phase picture of the same cells, then I can very clearly see their structure. So this is basically a shape and density map of these cancer cells. 
So this is extremely important for biological microscopy. In fact, there was a Nobel Prize for this in the 40s because uh, somebody figured out just how to make these phase objects show up. It wasn't a quantitative sort of map of the phase, but they figured out how to make the phase visible in some ways, partially, and uh, it made them be able to see things that they couldn't see before. And so it was extremely important. So my group does a lot of different quantitative phase imaging methods for various different things. So biological microscopy is a key piece. Another one is surface profiling. And that idea is that if I shine a flat beam at some object and it picks up some phase, that phase is proportional to the shape of the object. So we can do a surface profile. Uh, we actually are putting phase into um, x-ray security scanners for the airport. So when you check your bags, they go through an x-ray system to look for uh, dangerous things. And currently, that x-ray system is only taking absorption images. But there's a lot of things it can't see uh, that it will be able to see once it can, uh, once it can image phase. So that's the, the goal. We also work a lot with semiconductor companies where phase is a really big problem for them in being able to print really small circuits. That, that's becoming the limiting factor. OK, so how do we do it? Um, here's the simplest one. This is what I spent my PhD working on was take a normal microscope and figure out how to get phase information without doing anything too complicated, without making like expensive, uh, difficult to build, uh, complicated physical systems. And the way we did it was really simple. So we used focus stacks. So we said we put, a, we put an automated focusing mechanism on the microscope, and we simply took a couple of pictures at different focus positions. Very small changes, so you can't even really see the difference in the pictures, but they're there. And because we know that phase affects light's propagation, then we were able to write inverse problems to solve for the, the phase from these measurements. So I'm measuring intensity. It's absolute value squared, and this A is some operator on my complex field that I'm trying to solve for. Uh, so after that, we started getting into different architectures for doing this. So if you take a focus stack, that's great. But it's also, it takes some time to capture it. And there's some moving parts that we would like to eliminate. So I just want to generalize this sort of phase retrieval problem in general. And this is really getting into um, where we need computer science algorithms here. So we have some complex field. It's going through some optical system that's represented by this operator A. And my detector is going to measure intensity. So I need to design this A matrix um, so that I have an appropriate optical system so that the measurements contain information about the phase. So natively, they do not. But if I mess with the, the field along the way before it hits the camera, then I can get the phase information to affect the intensity information um, at the, at the detector. So previously, I did that with defocus. I said that after defocusing a little bit, some of the phase information becomes intensity information. I know how it becomes that way, so I have a chance to invert this problem. So this is a really subjective piece. We need to consider cost, simplicity, physical constraints, what the application is, where it's going to be, what kind of environment. Um, and then the, the next part is the easier or more straightforward part. It's find x. So I take nonlinear measurements y. It's nonlinear because I'm capturing absolute values squared. So it's actually bilinear. Uh, and then I know a, and I need to solve for x. So these kinds of nonlinear problems are notoriously hard. Uh, and now we're trying to do, they're notoriously hard because they're nonlinear, and they're generally non-convex. And now we're trying to do it across millions of pixels. So my image is typically 5 megapixels or so. And so my x vector is actually gigantic. It's like millions of pixels. In fact, you'll see later we're doing a case where it's gigapixels. And so the algorithms become extremely important because we can't just expect whatever analytical algorithm we derive to be implementable on a normal computer. So this is where we get into using some machine learning algorithms and smart parallel processing to compute these things in reasonable time. And generally, all of our algorithms amount to nonlinear optimizations. So when you do an optimization, you're always iterating through a whole bunch of different guesses and updating your estimate of your object. So you need that to run fast, or you're just going to be sitting there waiting forever. Or worse, you just won't even fit it into memory if the problem is too large. So this algorithm piece becomes important, but it also informs the optical system design. 
So I shouldn't design my matrix um, such that I'm going to have to do gigantic matrix inverses. If I have a 5 megapixel image and, my in and I need to inverse a 5 megapixel squared matrix, I'm in huge trouble. So Amazon Web Services can maybe do it for a lot of money, but we don't want to do that. We'd rather take the pictures in a better way so that we can do simpler processing. Okay, so here's the setup that we use most of the time now. This is just a different way to capture phase information, and we can do other things with it as well. So it's the same regular microscope that I had before, and now what I have different in, in hardware is that I'm only going to stay at one focus plane, but I'm going to start changing my illumination. So there's this LED array. Adafruit is an Arduino company. It's really cheap and simple. It costs about 100 bucks to set this all up. And uh, Arduino is really fun to program in. Kids can do it. So what we do is we, we replace the source of the microscope with this LED array. And then we're going to pattern the array to take pictures in different situations and then compute large scale images, 3D, and different contrast uh, functions from it. OK, so let's look at this a little closer. Uh, it's, so all of our methods are add-ons to normal commercial microscopes. Here it's a small hardware change and then a software add-on. So we have to do our computation um, uh, in a computer. And so we're patterning illumination angle. What I mean by that is if I zoom in on this, then my LED array is just sitting somewhere above my sample. So microscope, you have, you have to light up your sample, and then you image it from below. And so if I light up the center LED, I'm just illuminating it sort of on axis. Whereas if I light up one of these off axis LEDs, I'm illuminating from a different angle. So they're all illuminating the object sort of homogeneously with flat intensity, but from different angles. So that's how we're going to pattern. Uh, and this is where the optics comes in, but you can trust me on this. So if we light up the center ones, we get a normal microscope image. I call that a bright field image. Dark field is this case where I light up the LEDs on the outside of the array. And so you're lighting up the sample from very high angles. And my microscope just can't capture those angles. So the microscope has a finite range of angles that it can capture. And if I illuminate from angles beyond that, I see black images. However, if I illuminate from these high angles and my object scatters some of the light, then some of that scattered light can reach the sample. So you see these images that correspond to just scattered information. This is exactly the same thing as, you know, if you're looking, if I'm looking out here and the sunlight is shining in here, I can see dust particles from the side because they're, they're sort of side illuminated. Whereas if I stood and looked directly at the sun, I would never see them because they're overwhelmed by the, the, the main light coming from the sun. Okay, so phase is kind of strange. We, we light up half the circle, the other half of the circle, and we get our phase contrast image. So here's what the, the elemental images look like of the two half circles. So these are, uh, these are the same cancer cells, and you can see them. You can see something about them. This is phase contrast. If I add these two images, I cannot see them because that's the same as if I took a normal picture with all of the LEDs on the circle on. If I subtract them, however, I can strongly see these objects. And if you do some math, you can show that this picture is the first derivative of the phase. Um, so now we can just light up the dark field light LEDs and then these two halves and and sort of really quickly change them in time while we sync with the camera to capture um, all these three different contrast mechanisms from three different images. And here's a picture. This is a C. elegans worm. This is one of the most popular studied worms because it's really simple and dumb. Uh, and it's got, there's some babies coming in here. So we're seeing it in these three different contrast modes, and it's just you see different things about the objects when you look at these contrast modes. These are the three most popular contrast mechanisms for, um, for unseen samples. OK, so then we can take this first derivative measurement and invert the first derivative. This is also just a convolution method, and so it's just Fourier transforms. And then we can get these very fast capture of, of subcellular things happening within these cells. Um, so you can see a lot of stuff happening inside the cell. And this is stuff we really couldn't see before. We could do this kind of phase imaging. OK, so um, probably the, the coolest thing that this, this microscope can do is gigapixel imaging. So what I mean by gigapixel imaging is that I'm going to use this 5 megapixel camera and take a bunch of pictures and stitch together a gigapixel sized image. Um, so what do I need to do that? Well, I need. I need 
high resolution across a large area. So normally in a microscope, as in a camera, you've seen this in your regular cameras, you, you can take a the picture of a very large field of view. So I can get everybody in this room into my picture, but if I go zoom in on any one person's eyes, I can't, I can't resolve much details, right? Or I can take my zoom lens and I can zoom in on your eye and then I can very clearly see your eye, but at the cost that I can't see anything else around the rest of the room. So I have to choose between my field of view and resolution. And that's a fundamental limit of optics. You, you can't make lenses that can do both uh, without very large expense, and even then it's very difficult to do. So what we would like to do is to computationally do this, to circumvent these optical rules by doing computation. So here's an example image. These are uh, a couple thousands of uh, red blood cells. So when, you take, when somebody takes your blood and does a, a blood sample, this is what they will do. They'll go put it in an optical microscope and go looking for things. So for example, they might be looking for little parasites inside each of the blood cells. And these can be very rare, one in 10,000 or so. So they need to look at tens of thousands of cells, but they need to be able to see things that are within the cell. And these things are five or 10 microns big. So to do that, you really need this kind of large scale imaging. And we actually have this kind of resolution across the whole entire image. So how do we do it? Um, we do it all with one camera that has only five megapixels. Of course, we have to take a couple pictures. And now you can think of this as the map of the range of angles that pass through uh, the microscope or the Fourier transform of the object. So a large spread in this Fourier space is going to correspond to a high resolution. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go use a terrible lens that has a very large field of view but bad resolution. That means it doesn't cover much of this Fourier space. So the NA is the numerical aperture. It's just an optics term for the bandwidth of the sample of the, of the microscope. And what you see is I get a, a single low resolution picture, but it's got this large field of view that I want. And so now I need to take a bunch of low resolution <coughs> pictures and try to stitch together a higher resolution image. Now I can't just take a whole bunch of pictures and, and average them, of course. But what I can do is I can play with the illumination. So what I'm going to tell you is that if I illuminate from a different angle, what I do is I end up capturing a different area within this Fourier space. So I capture information about smaller features, but still with the same bandwidth. And so I, if I take a bunch of different pictures, I get different areas within this Fourier space. And I can take those simply by illuminating from different angles. So in our system, that just amounts to lighting up different LEDs in the LED array. So the, the maximum that I can get is the sum of the, the range of angles that the objective, which is our microscope, allows, and the range of angles that my illumination allows. So this can be really powerful. We can get, in this case, eight times better resolution in both dimensions just by taking a bunch of low resolution pictures. OK, so we like to take each of these pictures. Each circle here represents sort of the the coverage due to a single LED within our LED array. This is all to scale. Uh, and now we have this larger bandwidth, which means I can simply do the inverse Fourier transform, and then I have a higher resolution image. That's great. Uh, the problem with that is that if I want to do an inverse Fourier transform, I need phase information. And so uh, I need to do phase retrieval as well as stitching all these images together in the Fourier space. So uh, phase retrieval is what we're good at. That's what we do. Um, and we can set it all up as a nonlinear optimization. So each picture that we measure, which is, corresponds to each circle, is going to be um, a chunk of the object's Fourier transform. That's the circle there. The pupil function describes uh, the, the bandwidth limitations of the microscope, uh, also the aberrations. And they're all shifted according to which LED I use. So I have this nice forward model. And the next piece is to do the inverse problem, which is simply to solve for the object. So I'm trying to, you don't have to worry about the model, but I'm basically trying to solve for the object. Given a bunch of measurements, I would like to solve for the object. So I say, let's guess what the object is, and uh, then let's go and see if it's correct. So how do I see if it's correct? I take my object, and I put it through my forward model, and I predict what my measurements would have been if my guess of the object was correct. Um, so then I check and I see like what's the difference between my predicted measurements and my actual measurements. And I try to minimize 
uh, in a L2 way. I want to minimize the difference between my predicted and my actual measurements, given whatever estimate I have of the object. Um, so we're minimizing with respect to the object itself. We can actually play even more tricks and do something really cool where we can solve for two things. We can solve for the object and this pupil function, which I'm telling you represents the aberrations in the system. So we don't know how the aberra how, what the aberrations are, but we can solve for them and then we can digitally remove them. So all the pictures that I'm showing actually have already had all their aberrations removed, otherwise they would look horrible. So we're solving for two things. This is a joint estimation problem that we need to solve. We're trying to solve for a joint estimation problem where both of the things we're solving for are gigantic. So one's a gigapixel size image and one is a few megapixel size uh, aberration image. So this is hard to do all at once. The beauty is that the way we captured it, none of the different parts of, of real space, which is represented by R, interact with other parts. So we can simply take this giant image and solve this problem patch by patch. And this was part of the, the hardware design, was that I don't need to run a giant inverse problem where I need to invert gigapixel size matrices. I can just invert little small ones piece by piece in fact, that's really beautiful because then I can also put that on a parallel processor like a GPU or put it on the cloud or put it on a supercomputer. And I don't even have to worry about parallelization. It simply break the images into chunks and solve each chunk one at a time. So that's exactly what we do. So for each little chunk of the image, this is just a small chunk of the field of view, I start with my low resolution image and then I'm going to use the measurements that I made as an intensity constraint. So that's a constraint on our, our estimate of the object. Uh, and then I have a Fourier constraint that's set by what's the size of this circle. And I need to update the object estimate. This is the hard part, right? How do I change my estimate? So I guess the object, I was wrong. My estimated measurements don't match my actual ones. How do I change my estimate? So this part is very, um, uh, is the hard part. And the way we do it is based on like basic optimization theory. So we started out with a gradient descent approach. We actually use a little more sophisticated stuff now. But you can just simply derive the first derivative of the cost function. That's what gradient descent is. Take the first derivative of the cost function and then use it to set your, to set, uh, your how you're going to update your estimate so that you can go into the next iteration. And then just keep doing this over and over until it stops uh, changing. And then you've converged, hopefully, to the correct solution. Here's an example, as I add more and more images, I'm getting a better and better uh, resolution in my final result. So here's a, my large image, zoom in, bad resolution, do a bunch of computation, good resolution. And uh, in the process, we solved for the aberrations and removed them. So this is what the aberrations would have done to the image in a convolution way, but we've removed it. So we can get this, uh, in this case, six times of resolution improvement by doing this computation. So the optimization ma algorithm really matters a lot. If you go and look, then what we're doing is sort of a second order Gauss-Newton method. So second order method means I don't just use the first derivative of the cost function, but I actually also use the second derivative of the cost function, which is the Hessian. So this was actually really complicated to derive, but once you've got it, you just use it and you can simply uh, uh, up make better updates of your estimate as you go through the iterative process. And this does much better than these uh, gradient descent first order methods. So we had, there were some other methods that are, have been derived. We just compare against them. They're not very robust to various different, um, different noises and uh, model mismatch like aberrations. And we found that it really depends on what cost function you use. So uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of optimization going on behind the scenes here. Uh, in the end, what we are doing is very similar to what's used in machine learning for uh, artificial neural networks once we add all of the little tweaks that we need to get things running. Uh, so here's a picture. We have a lot of pictures on GigaPan where you can zoom in and look at inside an individual cell. This is dog tissue cartilage. Um, and then uh, the key thing that we really wanted to do with this, this is an application's desire is to do in vitro stuff. In vitro means like in a petri dish, so uh, so uh, in vivo means you're doing stuff live inside the animal. In vitro means you took it outside the animal but the cells are still alive. So you want to keep the cells alive. And live cells are alive so they're moving. And so everything becomes really challenging because we need to do stuff fast. 
One thing is we need to keep the cells alive, so we put an incubator in there. Uh, we can't stain the cells, so we need to do this phase imaging methods that don't involve staining. And we need real-time acquisition. So this is the hard part. I've been saying that I can make these beautiful images with high resolution, but I had to scan through every single LED and take a, single, a picture for every single one that I turned on. In the cases I've been showing you, we used about 300 images. So the LED array is time synced with the camera, so we can go about 50 frames per second, but it still takes like six or seven seconds to capture all that data. And live cells are moving during that time, and that motion's gonna blur out your image and just ruin the result that you've been going after. So you're trying to get higher resolution, but exactly those small things are what's moving at that speed. So we need brighter illumination just so we don't have to wait so long on our exposure times. We need hardware sync that's uh, just plumbing, and we need, uh, we need to go faster. So I'm going to talk about multiplexing because we can reduce both our capture time and our data uh, requirements. Here's an example image. This is the intensity picture, the phase picture. So you can see a lot more detail in phase. I zoom in, and I have this nice phase picture, which matches very nicely to my old methods, which I know work very well. So we know that our methods work. And this is comparing to some of the older versions that are capture a different type of image. Okay, so here's, uh, these are the cancer cells that I showed you before, and now they're alive. So they're moving around, and if I just zoom in, so these are gigapixel sized images for each time frame, and I can just zoom in to, for example, if I had a, an ADX microscope, then I would only have this field of view with the same resolution. So we're getting a huge field of view compared to what we should be getting. And you can watch these cells, this one's going to split in two, maybe you've taken Bio 101. It creates actin filaments, splits in two, curls in a ball, and then explodes into multiple cells. Uh, so this is cancer cells dividing, which has obvious important biological uh, reasons to study it. We have to do a lot of uh, processing on the data once we get it, because we have these really large, say you have a gigapixel per time frame, and you're looking for some rare event, or you want to count how many cells there are while these things are dividing over time. I don't want to do this manually, so we have um, some really nice software that can segment out the cells and figure out where, we, where one cell is separate from another, and then find, for example, dry mass is just the sum of the phase across the entire cell. So these things change as the cells are, are, um, are changing in the Petri dish, so we can actually watch these things happen. Uh, if we can process everything in an automated way. Okay, so getting into speed. Um, our camera goes about 50 frames per second and is 5 megapixels. So if I want to capture a gigapixel image, I pretty much need a second to do it. Uh, and that's the best case scenario. Actually, when I, told, when I showed you these circles here, they're all overlapping. And so I'm actually taking more images than I need. And there's a good reason for that because our phase retrieval algorithms, these nonlinear optimizations, just won't work if I don't overlap these circles. And so in the end, what happens is I have to capture about 10 times more data than I need, which is super wasteful, right? So I'm capturing 10 gigapixels to reconstruct one gigapixel, and my camera is my speed limit, so it's really hindering my time by a factor of 10. I can't simply drop images, and I can't overlap them less. But what I can do is uh, what we call multiplexing. And the idea is that Previously, we were doing our, our sort of operator is this sequential matrix. So we take one LED on at a time. So we turn on one LED, the next one, the next one, the next one, as we go and go through them one by one, and we cover them all. This matrix is obviously invertible, right? It's just the identity matrix. And so uh, doing the inverse problem here should be no big deal. So multiplexing is the idea that, well, I can create an invertible matrix A that has some weird coded pattern where more than one LED is turned on at a given time, but these columns will all be linearly independent of each other, as will the rows. And so this multiplex pattern uh, takes the same number of images, but there's more LEDs on at once. So I get brighter illumination, so I can take fewer pictures, or so I can take a, a shorter exposure time, but the same number of pictures. And I can invert this A matrix in the same way I could with this sequential scan. So compressed sensing is essentially the idea that sometimes if you know something about your object, for example, if you know that your object is sparse, if you know that it's mostly zeros, 
then you may not need to take all of the data that you did. If you use this multiplexing approach, you can simply throw away some of the data and it will still work. Um, you may have to impose some sort of constraints in your optimization to say that I know my object is sparse or I know my object you know, is just a few gray levels. Um, so compress sensing is using a priori information to cut down the number of measurements and it always comes with multiplexing. So it's always coming from the situation where I'm taking measurements that are linear combinations of my like, elemental measurements. So in our case, that's LEDs. Uh, unfortunately, our problem is nonlinear. We're taking absolute value squared. So not all of these rules directly apply, but we can still get around them and make it work. Um, so here's a low resolution image. And if I do my previous method where I scan each LED individually, I take 300 images, it takes about 10 minutes, but I get the nice high resolution image. So 10 minutes is unacceptable. These live, this is not live sample. If the sample was live, it would just be a big blur by now. Um, so we do our multiplexing. It looks like a disco party. But this is the picture of the LED array while it's taking the data. It's doing this multiplexing. Um, we, we very carefully choose the coded patterns that we use to illuminate. And you can see the incubator below it. And using those codes, we can actually get away with only using 40 images and get what's essentially the exact same result with only 17% of the data. And this is really because we had a lot of redundancy before. So it's not compressed sensing uh, in this sense that we're still getting towards a one-to-one -one data captured to data reconstructed uh, and not past it. So then we can take these uh, one hertz pictures of live cell samples. And this was really our end goal. These ones are really slow and boring. So we can move to going a bit faster and you see more stuff going on now. But now we have the chance to do really, really crazy uh, spatio-temporal resolutions uh, across really large populations of cells, which is really important to be able to see the subcellular stuff, but also follow the general trends of what the groups of cells are doing. So I'm calling this the space bandwidth time product. Space bandwidth product is really about the number of pixels. When you buy a, a camera or a monitor or a projector, uh, they always say that its resolution is 5 megapixels. That's not really resolution. That's space bandwidth product. Um, but now we can get a very good uh, time uh, here for the same space bandwidth product. So we're getting high resolution, large field of view, and fast times. And I really don't know that we can beat these times. Uh, so the last fun little piece is that we wanted to show how simple this was. And there's a group at Berkeley that makes a cell phone microscope. So we started doing all of this stuff on a cell phone microscope. We can pr do all of our, our programming in Android, and we get, uh, we get the, the same results. Of course, the phone's processor is much slower than the computer's, so we don't do full gigapixel images, but we do some sort of approximation to it. We can do all these different contrast modes, and uh, my students made a really nice Android app that you can choose your contrast mode. You can set it up uh, how you like or like click start and capture a data set and then reconstruct it. And this is actually really important. Cellscope was, was developed for point of contact uh, microscopy. So disease diagnosis is almost exclusively done uh, with optical microscopes. And in third world countries or places where they just don't have access to fancy, fancy medical labs, um, having a microscope on site is, could be extremely important for diagnosing diseases at the point of care before the people go home or uh, have to trek a full day's journey to a, a hospital or a medical facility. So particularly for malaria and other blood-borne diseases, it becomes important to be able to see things inside of the blood cells, which are very tiny, and across large populations. So we took this original cell scope and we replaced it with an LED array illuminator. It's a dome shape now because that gives us more light. Uh, and we simply do all of the same things we were doing before and then attempt to do the processing on the phone. Sometimes it takes a half an hour to get an image out, uh, but that's something that we can work on. So this dome shape actually makes a big difference. We get a lot more light because we're, we're, we're losing a lot of light with this flat array because the light has to travel further to get to the sample. So the dome actually points everything at the sample <coughs> and puts it at a uniform distance. So we get a lot of uh, improvement in light efficiency. It allows us to take the data faster but it does not allow us to process it faster. So here's just some pictures from our cell phone microscope. They have uh, equal quality to our, our normal microscope images, but this can all be done on the cheap and for very small portable devices. So that's all I'm going to talk about. I just want to give a, a quick overview. 
I know some of these optics uh, topics are new to people, but I think there's a lot of opportunity in this space where, um, where cameras and opticals hardware meet computer science and algorithms. And there's a lot to be said for people who can learn to, uh, to work on algorithms with, a very, uh, with one foot very deeply into the, the domain science of optics in our case to really learn how uh, the processing and the algorithms can be modified according to the hardware or in conjunction with the hardware. Um, so thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, if you want to play with any of this stuff, we have all our code and even some hardware designs posted online so you can build your own versions of this stuff. Uh, no, no guarantee that it's user friendly. <laughs> so thanks. Yeah, so you would have to do something to modulate the light coming into that pixel, but yeah, you could do it. Um, you could do that at home, get it some cardboard masks and shove them in. <laughs> uh -huh. How long have you been working on this stuff? Um, so this stuff with the LED array, we only started less than three years ago. So I've been at Berkeley three and a half years, and we just started that. But um, my whole career, I've been working on phase retrieval algorithms, and so, I mean... The, the secret sauce behind what we're doing is that we're good at phase retrieval, and that I've been working on for 15 years, probably. So, um, uh, yeah, I think I, I think like it's sort of getting familiar with a, a nonlinear, non-convex problem that shouldn't necessarily be solvable. It's a very difficult issue uh, across very large data sets, and so you really need a lot of intuition and expertise to do this well because there aren't provable uh, solutions yet. I hope there will be someday, but there aren't, yeah, no. So um, you, part of the thing was when you had the real-time sort of uh, imaging process and it had like incredibly like this massively like small amounts of data being put in there, is that like for like more than still images, is that better or? Um, so, signal to noise wise, if you take more images, it's better. Mm -hmm. So, if you have a lot of noise in your images, then more images just provides more averaging, and it's better. But if you if you're if you need to take the data fast, then you should drop them. Okay. And, and there's some trade off where, depending how slow your object is, you should take as many as you can, but not so many that it blurs. And it's kind of a fine line deciding between the two. Well, so there's a, there is a trade-off. If you looked at that circle, basically the more images we take, the higher resolution we can get. And at some point, so we actually stopped because we hit the edges of our array. Um, we're building a bigger dome that can go to a full 180 degrees. And there, uh, there, I think they will get to a point where it's not worth it to take any more because you're not getting enough light through at those very, very high angles. Uh, there's also the issue like... Um, yeah, if you, if you care about time, then to get, like, 2x resolution improvement is really easy to get, like, every, like, slight re 2x resolution improvement you need to take, you need to take, uh, like, an R-squared number of images. And so if you care about time, then getting extremely high resolution becomes sort of less attractive because it takes so long because you have to take so many more images to do it. So I think, like, the trade-offs we have here are sort of Let's go for a really big field of view and get like very good resolution, but not like the best possible resolution. So we could get our resolution maybe like a factor of 30% better, but uh, at the cost of taking maybe like 90, nine times more images. So I think that depends what you're doing, whether it's worth it or not. The cool thing is you can trade it off for each experiment just by choosing which LEDs to turn on. Um, yeah, so I, I was an undergrad at MIT, and I, there was a program where you get a master's in one year as an add-on to your undergraduate program. So I was like, yeah, two degrees, 
five years instead of one degree in four years. That sounds like a good value. So I did that, and that was like a one-year research project in a group that was working on this computational optics, and I really liked it, so I just stayed. That's what, so it was pretty random how I found it. <laughs> so thank you.